I do greet each one of you this evening in the name of Jesus, that I come to make all things new. I'm interested in that. And to come to give life in that more abundantly, and I'm interested in that. 25 years ago, I got a telephone call. Remember exactly where I was standing. Brother Gibbon was on the other end. I did not know Brother Gibbon. He did not know me. You know, Brother Gibbon can be blunt. Do you know anything about grace? <laughs> That's his first salvo. I'm looking for someone to testify if grace has changed their life. I accept it. Brother Boyce, of Brother Al, Brother Given, and I were on the program. Now, I was a little young back in those days. They had to slip me in the back door. <laughs> Brother Given found out not to worry about old folks, just go with those that had the spirit. <laughs> so us younger ones could move on in, but now we're getting some age on us. Brother Given, that phone call changed my life. And I thank you for it. But I thank all of you others that have joined in. Your, most of your life has been changed because of the refresh, refreshing waters. Thank you. What God makes Christ to us is my subject tonight, 1 Corinthians 1.30. It is because of God that you are in Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. I find it comforting every now and then to uh, put a noun for a pronoun. Try to make it a little more meaningful for me. So I go back and read this. It is because of God, Leon, that you're in Christ. Christ has become for you, Leon, wisdom from God. That is, Leon, your righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let Leon, who boasts, boast in the Lord. As our brother said, it's personal, <laughs> though not private. Well, let's take a little quiz now, see if you caught this. Are you in Christ? That's because of God. <laughs> Are you wise? It's because of Christ. Are you justified or righteous? That's due to Jesus. Are you sanctified and made holy? That's the work of Jesus. <laughs> Will your body be redeemed? <laughs> That's because Jesus is going to redeem it. Okay. I want to note here particularly, he said, who Jesus has become for us. Now we love that expression, but God. You better love this expression, for us. Amen. I just get to thinking of all the wonderful things you can say about Jesus. You know, it is a great salvation. I'm telling you, these Yankees could speak so fast, I could, they could speak faster than I can hear. <laughs> but the wonderful words about God and Jesus. But for this poor, humble servant, I can't think of a more precious thought than Jesus took my place for me, for us. 
He is our substitute. Now, this is kind of a summary verse, as the Apostle Paul could often do. Because after all, salvation is bigger than any one word. Here he used three words for our salvation. Righteousness, or sometimes justification, I'll call it. Holiness, or sanctification. And redemption. I don't want to put God in a box here, but I'm going to kind of look at for tonight. This redemption is the redemption of our body. Now, again, I don't put God in, in a box, and if there's other explanations of redemption, and there is, uh, that's good too. And I want to think about salvation here is justification or righteousness, holiness, sanctification, and our redemption. A summary verse, the salvation of man is kind of wrapped up tersely here and stated that it's all from God. It's all because of God. It's all through Jesus. Spe now specifically, as I think about this, God has saved us. That's the justification part. He is saving us sanctification part, and I'm not suggesting there's not been more sanctification, but he is saving us sanctification. Amen. And he's going to save us Amen. in redemption. Amen. So he's done it for us. He's doing it to you. Going to do it to you. Now he's doing it in you. Now this corresponds to Jesus' three appearances. Direct correlation, Hebrews 9. 9.26, once in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Of course, other verses verify this numerous, especially Romans 4.25, who Jesus was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. See? Yes. All right. Second Timothy 1, 9, to me, fits this. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling? Saved us and told us about it. Well, to me, that's, that's a beautiful picture of justification. There's it, not all of salvation. Because I, I'm... I still got this body, so I'm waiting. I'm not going to have it forever. Good. All right. Now, see, when we were kids, we loved to argue about salvation because, you know, we had some other folks over here kind of we called our enemies. So, but we were always talking about redemption of the body. They were always talking about justification. But we're both just calling it salvation. But we both were ignorant. We ought to have been talking about sanctification. <laughs> what was going on right now. But, but they were stuck in what happened in the past. And we were stuck in what's going to happen in the future. And we missed out on part of our great salvation here. All right. Hebrews 9 also calls the second appearance. He's now appearing in the presence of God for us, again, ministering the new covenant blessings to us. What are some of those? Such as putting God's law in your mind. Such as writing it on your heart. Such as causing you to walk in his way. Does that sound like sanctification? <laughs> See, that's what Jesus is doing. See, he's all of this stuff. I can't take much credit for anything here other than just wanting to be caught up in it and believing it. Yeah. And I love over there, we, we like, of course, Jeremiah 31 gives us the new covenant. But Jeremiah 32, down in there is just some rich stuff. He says, like he gives the singleness of heart in action so that we'll always reverence him. 
He that makes the everlasting covenant with us will never stop doing good to us, inspires us to reverence him, so we'll never turn away. Oh, holy, sanctified people, we in turn bring him renowned, bring him honor, joy, and praise. In short, <laughs> let's bring God glory through our worship. All right, and then lastly, of those three appearances, he will appear the second time on earth, of course, to redeem us, to redeem this body without a sin offering. That, that's all taken care of. Behold, he is coming, and his reward is with him. Amen. Now, let's take a moment from the old human perspective, Adamic, perspective we say God had a dilemma of how to justify the ungodly and remain just well of course that's human speaking I don't think you ask God he'd, he'd say I got a problem here but but that's okay it's accommodative language I'll go along with it God had the solution all the time Amen. as well has been pointed out that it was Jesus for us, a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. For we were even here, God took care of it. And an incarnate son, incarnate word, his son, called here God's wisdom but also called in this first chapter of uh, Corinthians, around 24th verse, his power. Of course, you know that this Jesus, that God has made unto us his wisdom, is a crucified Jesus, but a resurrected Jesus, and on the right hand of the Father. Now, he's our wisdom. But also, we know he's God's power. So God made Jesus Christ our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption as his way to save us, called his power, his wisdom. Now, let, now let's look back to see where God began to kind of develop his wisdom. See, biblically, uh, the first 39 books were written over about a thousand-year period of time. You know, they covered much more history than that, but it's just written in this period of time. These scriptures began by Moses through Malachi. Moses covered actually creation very quickly. And the fall of man, then he begins to delineate, not really spending a lot of time there, but it was important time. The remedy of the fall of man was given as God preached the gospel there first. It always amused me that he preached it to the devil. I, I don't think the devil thought it was good news, but man, Adam and Eve, whew, that had to be good news to them. Faith in the coming seed. Yeah, they had to suffer, cast out. That's what they had to hold on to. Faith in the coming seed. To trust that God was going to keep that promise. Even then as now. Those justified by faith, God will save. I don't know of a covenant that God ever made in which that's not true. The just shall live by faith. Yeah. That's right. true of Adam. You expect to see him in heaven? It is going to be because of his faith. Yeah. Boy, Habakkuk shed a lot of light on that. Well, God through Habakkuk shed a lot on that. He that lifts himself up. See, God's not pleased with us that are ready to be saved on our own. The just shall live by faith. So those Old Testament scriptures there are all messianic. Just beginning right there. They're all messianic. His intention and meaning were written 
shed light on a Messiah. And to sustain those that were walking then, looking for the Messiah. Amen. Jesus just put it tersely. He said, oh, those scriptures? Oh, they testify me. Yeah. Boy, if you can't find Jesus on the page, you can go reread it. Amen. Stay right there till you can. They testify him. Now, New Testament writers, of course, confirmed all of these things. Uh, for instance, Ephesians and Colossians unfolds, Paul does this as a mystery concerning this seed of the woman. But it's now revealed, all worked out. This seed was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself through your Justification, sanctification, and redemption. Paul to the Ephesians, of course, he told them that God chose us in Christ before the creation. But no doubt, God enlisted these wonderful writers of prophets, as well as Moses, of course, was a prophet. They're moved by the Holy Spirit, directing the eyes of their hearers to look forward for the blessing associated with that seed that would bring salvation and how would that seed bring salvation? God would make him your righteousness yeah, amen. and your sanctification and your redemption. Now from, from Eden we see the uh, divine activity that just kind of directs this seed through history. There, righteous Abel, faithful Abel, killed, no descendants, Cain cursed, doubtful of value of any of his descendants. God just raises another line. Yeah, amen. Yeah. And he gets to Abraham. No, not going to take Ishmael. Well, he's firstborn. No, out of here. Same way with Esau and Jacob. God, what I'm showing you is just God's directing all of this history. Amen. Out of those 12 sons of Jacob, go all the way down to the fourth one at least. Reuben, Simeon, and Levi disqualified. Going to take Judah. He's the line here. So the genealogy of the seed owes everything to divine activity. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. The ancestors of the seed, which will be God's power and God's wisdom, those ancestors was God's choice. So we'll get to Noah, naturally we carry his genes as well as our Savior. His granddad was Enoch, who walked with God. Of course, uh, Noah did too. I always like to ask the kids in, in Africa, what do you think about when I say Noah? No, I said, the ark. I said, not me. I think of him as a preacher of righteousness. Yeah. Well, one could say he didn't have much luck. But we're here. <laughs> he, he had enough luck. <laughs> Don't go around counting numbers as success. Uh, yeah. Jesus made it. Hallelujah. Amen. From Noah. So the whole of this is uh, to let us be firmly convinced that the seed of the woman is not an accident, nor a second thought, nor anything else, but what God ordained. Amen. The seed, God's wisdom, as well as God's power to remove the curse of universal judgment and condemnation. Oh, man. That condemnation, it, it just Adam and Eve walking and talking with our Creator in the cool of the evening, God just revealing Himself to them, bringing Himself glory. That, that, that's what He's doing. Everybody happy about all of this. down the drain. 
They went that away hiding in the bushes. God went that away. He don't want to fellowship them anyhow. Well, of course, that was a great act of mercy to one time get them together and preach the gospel as well as the curses. Now, how's God going to reveal himself? Well, he, of course, didn't leave himself without witness. Yeah, we know that. But it's, that's not enough for God, as the brothers have pointed out. Heaven's made to declare his glory, but it doesn't show much about his justice and mercy and love and those things. A lot the creation can't tell you. Lots of law doesn't show you either. It shows you some. You know, those laws did come from the mind of God. He didn't check with anybody. So it shows you something, but not enough. It's like, God, what are you going to do? Now, again, I'm human speaking. Well, by the way, uh, Isaiah, God told Isaiah, I'm going to choose my servant Israel. They'll be responsible. He'll be responsible for my glory. That's, that's Isaiah 49. But Israel is just a metaphor for Jesus. Because it goes right on down there and, and talks about the work of Jesus. So Jesus is in charge of God's glory, which means Jesus is in charge of revealing God to us. Jesus is in charge of us understanding God. Jesus is in charge of us drawing nigh to God. Jesus is in charge of us seeing God. And Jesus is in charge of when we see Jesus to bring joy to our hearts. And when we see God the way he needs to be seen. It will bring joy to your heart. And when you get happy with God, you're going to praise him. Amen. And when you praise him, that's my word for worship. Now, I don't, I'm tired of going into these places as it's time for worship. Well, it's past time for them. <laughs> Okay. Amen. Well, let me get off that here. <laughs> Go to Second Corinthians, uh, fifth chapter, seventy. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Underlying all of this is uh, someone's been justified. Someone is being sanctified and someone is going to be redeemed. All things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. That's the uh, justification part, the reconciliation. And he's given us the minister of reconciliation. In other words, we need to go tell people that God's justified. And he wants to sanctify them. And he will. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and committed unto us the word of reconciliation. On down, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now I want to read one more passage, 1 Corinthians 1.20. To establish a principle here. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the dispute of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And of course, I know it's the foolishness also of what is preached. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, but to the Greeks it's foolish, but unto them which are called. 
Jews or Greeks, the power and wisdom of God. Amen. All right. Power and wisdom of God gave us this justification, sanctification, and redemption. Now, God's ordained preaching to occupy a lofty position. Amen. Now, when you proclaim the gospel, you're in an upper position. Because you're talking about the wisdom of God and the power of God. Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to Abraham. Preaching's always <laughs> been important. Not just to, as always, saying, In you all the nations of the earth be blessed. And what was preached to Abraham? Jesus, the godly seed. Nations would be blessed themselves only through that seed. Amen. And to you, Abraham, your seed, meaning one person who is Jesus Christ. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. This seed is the individual of the human race, the last Adam who brings universal blessing from the universal condemnation. Amen. He wears the crown Amen. as king of kings and lord of lords. He is the ruler. Now I want to hearken back just a second to Genesis 48, 49. It's a touching emotional discourse of the last days of Jacob. Israel, handling of his final affairs. My wife and I used to have occasion to read old wills, and I was touched by some of those, and never one touched me like Jacob's. He hearkens back on essentially his deathbed, hearkens back to that tumultuous time of his life that he's running for it and he gets to Luz L-U-Z lays his head on a rock to sleep and heaven opened he had to catch it in a dream but it was enough. God blessed him. And you know what he blessed him with? I don't have to tell you. I'm just trying to let you see the picture of when Jacob got the blessings of the father Abraham and father Isaac. And God blessed him by exceeding great and precious promises by which he then could partake of the divine nature. And he did. Oh, I know it took a good many more years, but he's looking back now nearly a hundred years when he had to sleep on that rock. Then he gathers those boys around him, sons, and he reaches Judah and announces the scepter will not pass from you Judah until Shiloh comes to the one comes to whom it belongs that's Jesus the wisdom and power of God the prophecy of Jacob is just merely a continuation of Genesis 3.15, Genesis 22.18, and all the others. Actually, Ezekiel, 1,300 years after Jacob promised that to Judah, God picks this up to a wicked and profane ruler of Israel. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to overturn you. I'm going to ruin you. 
the rule and scepter, it shall be no more for you until he comes to whom, whose right it is. Now God just didn't pick anybody to be his wisdom and power. He picked the right one. So Jesus, the wisdom and power of God, wears the diadem. Of course, Jeremiah just called him the Lord, our righteousness. He could also call him God's wisdom. He could also call him God's power. He could also call him the Lord, our holiness, our sanctification, our redemption. Now, how's all this work out in your life? In Romans, Paul starts with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ or the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm ready to preach it. It's the power of God and salvation. All who believe, okay. So he pronounces it as God's power. Now, if salvation... It's justification, sanctification, redemption, and it is. Then, the death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus undergirds every one of them. Not just justification. Now, we know that's plain. He was delivered for our transgression. Raised for our justification. Okay. And we see quickly how the cross and resurrection gets involved in that, but it also must be involved in sanctification and um, redemption. The blood of Jesus, what I'm telling you, has done its work. Amen. It's taking care of sin. That's, that's what the blood's for. But how about the sinner? Y'all still there? What are we going to do about the sinner? God sent her. Said, I'm going to crucify you. When? In Jesus. That's what he said. That's another work of the cross. So Paul directs himself in the book of Romans, beginning there somewhere in the fifth chapter, directs himself away from talking about sin to dealing with the sinner. And as he develops his story, you know, the sixth chapter of Romans is a favorite for uh, most of us, and uses such phrases as this, knowing this, what Paul said, now here's something you can know, that our old man is crucified with him, Oh, why do we need to do that? That the body of sin might be destroyed. Amen. That henceforth we should not serve sin. Amen. He that is dead is freed from sin. Does that sound like sanctification? Yeah. Or have I missed something? I'm showing you the cross is involved in your sanctification. Yeah, you know you're justified by the blood. That takes care of the sins. But now you can know that you as the sinner was crucified with him also. Are you confident that he justified you by his blood and resurrection? Yeah, you are. Be confident that he crucifies your old man. Now, Paul further develops this in the 11th verse. He says, likewise. In other words, this is going to be kind of like the one I just told you. Likewise. Reckon. Do you mind if I use the word count? That'd be fine. Okay. Likewise, count yourself dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I was a math teacher. I know how to count. And you know how to count. 
one of the very, very few things on this earth that we can do fairly well is count. Now I'm going to count the money in my pocket. 20 bucks. How's my counting? Suppose I told you there's 19. Suppose I told you it's 21. It's the truth. It's 20. I'm counting it. Count yourself dead. How? Because you are. Amen. Our God's not going to ask you to count something that's not true. Amen. Now you count yourself dead and deed to sin. Amen. But alive unto God. Ooh, hallelujah for that. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we can count ourselves dead again to sin because it's true. Now, I'm, I must, must add this. You're not dead within yourself. You're dead in Christ. Yeah, okay. Now surely you understood that I knew that. <laughs> okay. This was God's own act that put you into Christ. So as the admonition of all the speakers has been abide there. What we think of as our experiences is only God entering us into the Jesus' history and experience. God put me in Christ, so what's true for Christ is true for me. Was he crucified? So are you. Uh -huh. Was he raised? So are you. Did he ascend to the heavenly places? So did you. Raised us up to sit right there. Abide there. There you can behold the glory of God and be transformed into his image. It's the work of God that puts you there. He has done it. Claim it. Stay there. Don't look at yourself like you were not in Christ. Look at Christ and see yourself there. Rest there. Live in the expectation that the work he has begun in you, he will complete. It's for God to make good on his promises that sin shall not have dominion over you. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen.